Good morning. Welcome to London First Baptist Church. It's good to be back. We were out last week worshiping with Chattahoochee Baptist Church in Marietta, Georgia. Had a great week with the youth and um, just keep them in your prayers and keep the church in your prayers. It was a good experience and a lot of really good things happened. So uh, thank you guys for sending us. Uh, we head out again on Saturday for Kansas City. So uh, kind of in one of those stretches of youth ministry in the summer. Uh, we're glad you're here. Glad you've chosen to worship with us. This morning's call to worship com comes from Psalm 25, verses 4 and 5. Let's stand as we read from God's Word. Make your ways known to me, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. I wait for you all day long. All right. Good morning. Y'all had a good weekend? I had a pretty good weekend. Is it a good day to be uh, here with God's family? Good deal. Y'all ready to sing some songs? <laughs> Goodness gracious. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my soul. My song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my side. Angels descending bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior. Submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long.
gather together to worship and sing and to praise our Lord. And of course, part of our worship is, in fact, prayer. It's an opportunity we have to go before Him and declare His greatness. Because you don't pray to someone who can't do anything. You pray to someone who is able to do all and even more than we ask and uh, will answer our prayers perhaps in ways that never would have occurred to us. So as this morning we continue our worship, we are going to, in fact, pray. Uh, Alan mentioned a few moments ago that... Uh, uh, the, the Atlanta team just got back it was this, this past Tuesday, right? And uh, so not to spend too much time in one place, there's, a, there's another team going to Kansas City this coming Saturday. All right, thank you. And, uh, of course, I know most of you guys know that we are partnering with a church plant up in the Kansas City area, River Park. We pray for them on a regular basis. And so the team that Alan's leading this coming weekend will be going up to River Park and spending several days with them or that whole next week with River Park. And uh, by the way, we, we sent a team there in, in May, and we're also going to be sending a team to River Park to work with them in September. And that'll be just a weekend-long trip. We'll be leaving on a Friday and coming back on a Sunday night and probably looking for seven, eight, ten of those who will be willing to go and spend the weekend doing some outreach that weekend, probably in the latter half of September. If that's something you'd be interested in, uh, let me know. It's, it's a, again, that's just a quick weekend trip up to Kansas City to, to work with uh, River Park Church. So... Uh, we're going to be praying for the team. So uh, before we pray, we're going to read some scripture. We're going to let that scripture guide our prayer this morning. So we're going to be reading from 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that the, His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. For by these 
He has granted to us His precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Uh, before we, as, as we pray, we did this with our team that went to Atlanta. I want to pray over a team that's going to Kansas City. If I know that's a smaller team this time. There's only three of you here, there's only, but there's only like five or six going. So um, if you're going on the trip to Kansas City this week, would you all just come on down here and stand in front of the table? And, and uh, we want to send you guys out with prayer and with, okay, it's, it's the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's the Johnston family. There are the, so the other three that are going are Nick, and Jim and Bailey. All right, your uh, Nick's uh, Nick's daughter. So um, we want to pray for them as they head out this next week to do work of the Lord and want to send them out and commission them. So if you will join with me and bowing your eyes and or bowing your heads, closing your eyes, <laughs> and. Uh, would you simply begin this morning by praying that God's grace and peace would be multiplied in your own life and in the lives of those around you this week? Would you pray for your knowledge of Christ to grow this week? Take some moments to thank the Lord for providing all that you need for this life and for eternity. Take a few moments to confess those times this past week or even today when you have given in to the corrupted values of this world. Ask forgiveness and thank Him for His grace. Would you pray that the character of Jesus Christ and the results of His life would be seen in the lives of the team going to Kansas City this next week? Would you pray that God would give you the chance to share His grace and the hope of Christ with someone around you and that the Kansas City team would have the same opportunity? Heavenly Father, just as Peter greeted and prayed so long ago, we ask the same thing this morning. Would your grace and peace be multiplied to us today? May our knowledge of you be multiplied today and in the coming days. Father, we know each and every moment of each and every day, we need your peace. We need your grace. Father, we know that you have given us all that we need for life, for godliness, through Christ. We cannot thank you enough for these things. Father, would you make sure and ensure within our own hearts and minds that we are aware of all that you have done. In the coming days, when we have those moments where we feel like we just can't make it through, when we're not sure what we can do next, that your, that your gifts to us are ever up the front of our minds, that we understand that each and every day you have given us all that we need for that day. Father, we confess that maybe even this morning, but for sure at some point this last week, we we gave in to the, the temptations of this world, the corruption that is around us. Father, we ask that you would forgive us for our sins this morning. 
And as you forgive us, let us rest again in your grace and the joy that comes in your forgiveness. Father, in the next few days, we pray that not only would your grace and the character of Christ be evident in our lives as we go about our work and our job and our times with our family, but Lord, as a group heading to Kansas City this weekend, that your character, that the gospel of, of, of itself would be evident in their actions. We pray over the, the five going to Kansas City to work with River Park, that you would make the character of Christ visible through them, that you would fill them with the Spirit of Jesus in such a way that all those they come in contact with would see you. Well, we pray the same for River Park Church, even as they're meeting this morning. Lord, have your hand upon that church plant as they reach out to their community. Not for their own sake, but Lord, for the kingdom's sake. For Lord, ultimately here this morning, we are not serving London First Baptist, and they will not be serving next week River Park Church, but Lord, we serve the kingdom of God. And would you make it grow and expand and be glorified through us this morning and through the team in Kansas City next week. Father, we pray that you would give us the opportunity this coming, this coming week to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, to speak into someone's life the truth of the cross and of the resurrection. Would you do that for the team in Kansas City and for River Park Church? Give them the chance to speak the gospel to those that do not know you. Father, may we see every opportunity, every chance you give us to live out your promises, to share in the work of Christ, and to make the kingdom known. We do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our gospel moment today is Matthew 17, uh, verses 1 through 5. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. And, and as we listen to him, let's stand and let's sing to our king here.
I cast my mind to Calvary. Oh, that's bad. That was my fault. <laughs> Welcome to practice, everybody. I've said it before. It's great that it's okay we make mistakes because God covers those for us. Let's try this in the right key here. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bowed and drenched in tears they laid him down in justice to the entrance seal by heavy stone messiah still and all to sing in praises to our Lord. I want to invite you this morning to open up your Bibles. We're going to be in a couple different passages this morning, but first, Matthew chapter 28. There are any number of ways of this life that we can be identified with a certain group or idea or even a, a cause. 
Maybe we wear a t-shirt. That's a popular one. Wear a t-shirt and you can be identified with a certain group or activity or a sport. You know, we're we live in the Russellville School District, so it won't be uncommon to see kids wearing Russellville high school stuff, Russellville Cyclones, or maybe Arkansas Tech gear. That identifies you with a certain group, right? A certain activity or a certain team. Your uniform identifies you with what side you're on. There's a reason when you're watching a sports game, whether it's football or basketball or baseball, whatever it is, that two teams don't generally wear the exact same uniforms on both sides. That would be... Confusing, wouldn't it? Which side, are you, which side are you rooting for? You identify with a certain side by the uniform that you wear. So sometimes it's a uniform. Sometimes, uh, I remember being in school, it's been a while for me, but man, even in school you can sometimes see what group a person belongs to, maybe a social group, by what kind of clothes somebody wears. I know when I was in high school, I tended to, I tended to often, especially during basketball season, I was on the basketball team, I'd, you, you just wore sweats to school. Oh, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, one, of, that's one of the basketball guys there, because he wore sweats to school. You, you, even your style of clothes sometimes would tell you what group you belong to. It may be different for each and every spot, but there are any number of ways for us to make sure that people know who we are, that we can identify ourselves with somebody or with a group or with a cause. There are any number of scriptures in the Bible they indicate how we as followers of Christ, people of God, are to be unique, different, set apart from this world, and identifiable as those who follow Jesus. The way we talk, the way we act or behave, our worldview, our treatment of other people, one another, and those around us. We have explored many of these the last two months. We have been spending the last two months in identifying or describing what is the church. We have explored that we are a people of faith, a, a people of a unique belief. We are a people of fellowship, of committed relationships with one another. We are a people of worship, of people of gathering together, our commitment to one another. We are marked by, the Scripture says, our, the presence of the Holy Spirit within our lives. But there are two activities, there are two practices, if you will, that the New Testament sets aside as particular expressions of our identity with, with Jesus Christ, with his side, if you will, with his team, if you will. We call them ordinances. We know them as baptism and as the Lord's Supper. These are two things that have been set aside in Scripture to identify the team, if you will, that we are with. So we're going to look at these two things this morning, these two identifiers of the church of Jesus Christ. First, Matthew chapter 28. Now, we are going to read a passage of Scripture that we are familiar with. We talk about it as being called the Great Commission. But we're going to see in it something important for us this morning. Matthew 28, verse 19, or verse 18. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, there is a lot in that verse that we're not going to get to this morning. But as we call that the Great Commission, we see that there is, in fact, one command. It says, make disciples. That is actually the command that everything else in that passage swings on, to make disciples. So for those of you who like grammar, that's the, that's the command. That's the imperative there. The rest, of these all, the rest of those all support that idea, but the first one there is this idea of that part of making disciples, part of discipleship is to, in fact, baptize. We even have the name Baptist of the church because we have recognized the, important of the, the importance of the idea of baptism. Part of making disciples, making followers of Christ, includes teaching all that Jesus has said, but it also means to it also means to go to the nations, and it means to baptize. So why do we baptize? Why, how do we baptize? When do we baptize? Now, those are not addressed in this passage of Scripture. In fact, you won't really see them directly addressed throughout, really, the New Testament. 
But it remains so that the command to baptize is clear throughout the New Testament, and the assumption that all believers will be baptized is also clear throughout the course of Scripture. Jesus specifically commanded us in Matthew 28 to baptize, something he told us to do. Now, of course, there's a great many things we're commanded to do by Christ and by Scripture. We're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. We're to love your neighbors as ourselves. We're to go to all the world. And there's a great deal more. We couldn't list them all this morning. But these two practices, baptism and Lord's Supper, we have been commanded to. So why do we baptize? Let's deal with that for a little bit. We could see any number of passages throughout the Scripture, throughout the New Testament in particular, that talk about baptism, at least describe how it takes place or when it takes place. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, sh uh, follows shortly after the Acts of, of Pentecost, and you'll see that they are, in fact, baptizing all those who were converted that day. We recognize there were thousands and thousands that were baptized on that day, but actually, let me just read this for you. Acts 2, 38, Peter says, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 41, So then those who had received his word were baptized. That day there were added about 3,000 souls. Acts chapter 8 speaks of the same thing. Acts 18 of the same thing. Acts chapter 19, the same thing. In fact, just throughout all of the New Testament, it talks about this. In the New Testament, it's assumed, and it's a regular practice that Every believer is baptized. They're baptized in the New Testament every single time following the confession of sin and their expression of faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Every one of them. So much so that even in Acts chapter 19, Paul is, in, is, is, in, is on a mission journey and he's come across some who have heard about John the Baptist. In fact, they've been baptized, they say, in the baptism of John the Baptist. And we talked about that a year, about a year or so ago. See, we're going through the book of Acts. And the baptism of John uh, that we see in the Gospels is a baptism of repentance. So the idea is that I'm going to repent of my sins and identify that I need the work of God's Messiah. Now, when John the Baptist is around yet, most of them don't know that's going to be Jesus just yet. But it's a, it's a baptism of preparation, of confession and repentance, waiting for Messiah. And so these individuals in, in Acts chapter 19 had been baptized at, with, with repentance, anticipating the coming of the Messiah. But they didn't know who Jesus was yet. They just heard about John the Baptist. And so Paul shares with them that Jesus Christ is whom they were waiting for, who they were prepared for, and upon accepting Christ, they are then baptized following their conversion or their exercise of faith in Christ. So upon hearing of the one that John was talking about, they confessed belief and were baptized to identify no longer with John the Baptist, but to identify with Jesus the Christ. So for us, baptism has a bit of this dual meaning. It's a demonstration of an already accomplished fact. It's, it's the way in which we express that we have confessed our sin, we have repented and placed our faith in Jesus and what he has done. We are identifying ourselves with him through baptism. In every instance of the New Testament, water baptism of believers in the New Testament, it means this. It means this identification with Christ. Now, water baptism does not create faith. It doesn't make us saved. It's not a promise of something that will happen in the future. It's an expression of an already accomplished faith and salvation. One is not, if you will, saved because one went through baptism. That's accomplished, salvation is, by grace through the gift of faith. That is then, baptism is, or baptism then follows or is that public declaration of what has already happened. So we, play, we confess our sins, place our faith in Christ, and baptism is then a way to express what has already happened. It's a way of identifying with Jesus through that and demonstrating to the world that we're on his team, if you will. That's part of what takes up. That's part of what makes baptism so special. So to sum up in the New Testament, water baptism is something received or reserved for those who have confessed and repented of sin and placed their faith on Christ and accepted His grace and salvation. It's an identification with Jesus and His people. Now let me add, baptism is something that we are commanded to do not only 
as a church, as we make disciples, is something expected of every follower of Christ. It's something commanded and expected of every believer. Water baptism doesn't make you a Christian, but it publicly marks you out as a Christian. If you have come to faith in Christ and have not been baptized, please understand that your salvation may not necessarily be in question, but if one of the very things that Christ has commanded us to do, you have failed to do, that does bring up a problem, doesn't it? If I confess Jesus Christ as Lord and say I believe in Him and I want to follow Him, but I'm not going to do the very first thing He said to do, there may be an issue. If you've accepted Christ's work, why would you not want to identify yourself with Him? Now, I don't want to overstate baptism in this sense. It, again, it doesn't save us. But I don't want to understate it either. It's the way Jesus himself has given us to be identified publicly with him. We sometimes, at least in Baptist circles, I'll speak to that. You know, sometimes, traditionally, in Baptist churches, we, people might accept Christ, and they might come forward down an aisle during an invitation. And some people might see that act of coming down and declaring to the church, the, that's, that's, a, that's a fairly public act. And that's fine. Not discouraging that necessarily, but in Scripture, the public declaration of faith in Christ is the baptism. That's how it took place. We, we live in a culture in a world here in the United States that's pretty easy to publicly identify with Christ in many respects. Even today, it still is. There's no real risk to it. But in most of the world, throughout most of history, if you want to publicly identify yourself with Christ and you went through baptism, you probably got baptized in a lake or a river or some public way, and the community sees that you are now identifying yourself with Jesus. And that's a big deal. That's what baptism is. Secondly, not only does baptism identify you as a follower of Christ who has repented from his sin and follows in faith in Jesus, it even pictures it. It demonstrates it in the act itself. Through the entrance into the water, the submersion into the water, the arising out, we see death, burial, and resurrection. We also, in addition, see a reflection of several passages in the New Testament where baptism is, is used in kind of a spiritual sense. We're baptized in the Spirit, 1 Corinthians says, or Romans says, and Galatians says. We're baptized into Christ, the Scripture says. In these passages, there is more than water baptism being referred to. Baptism or immersion into Christ is a picture of how, through faith in Christ, we are now in Christ, just as we were in the water. And all that he has done is now ours. If I'm in a car, I go wherever the car goes, right? The car goes to Russellville, guess where I'm at? I'm in Russellville. If I am in Christ, wherever he goes, whatever he's done is where I am and what I've done as well. In fact, this is how the Bible often describes us in the New Testament as in Christ. So if I'm in Christ, I go where he goes, I do what he does, I am According to Scripture, the Heavenly Father sees what Christ has done and gives it to me because I'm in Christ, like I might be in the car. What He has done, I get credit for. His holiness becomes mine. His death on the cross becomes mine. His resurrection will become mine. Water baptism proclaims and pictures that. Now, I do want to address quickly a couple of other things around baptism. One is this. How old must someone be to be baptized? And what is the method or the mode, if you will, of baptism? Neither of which is exactly directly addressed in Matthew 28. First of all, as to age. Since baptism in the New Testament is always something done in response to someone's conversion, it's reasonable to conclude that baptism must be reserved for those who can demonstrate an understanding and the acceptance of the gospel. They have to be old enough to have a faith and express that faith and understand what it is they are doing. In the, New, in the New Testament, baptism almost always takes place fairly quickly after someone accepts Christ. Now, that being said, in the New Testament, we have almost exclusively adults being converted, at least that we know of. Uh, now, that being said, when Paul is writing his letters uh, later on in the New Testament, the church has been around at that point for nearly 20 years. So they have already had the chance to see children raised in the church at that point in time, if you, if you will. 
So no hard and fast age is given in the, new, in the scriptures, but other than this, we need to know that in order for someone to be baptized, they must already have accepted Christ. And they must have demonstrated that ability to understand what's going on. So whether they're 7 or 77, <laughs> that needs to take place. Otherwise, baptism simply becomes a ritual that has no meaning. Now, I do want to, I do want to make note because we have people who I get asked this question on a pretty regular basis regarding the practice of baptizing infants. This practice is usually seen by those who believe, who receive baptism as essentially a, a New Testament version of the Old Testament practice of circumcision. That is the understanding behind it. And there is, to be sure, a logic about that that makes, certain, that makes sense. Designating a baby, if you will, to come in as belonging to a covenant people in the way that the Israelites would have circumcised an eight-day-old child. And we actually even talked about this a bit on Wednesday nights a couple of weeks ago as Abraham was given the idea of circumcision when God called him. But I would argue, as many have throughout the years, that that practice, seeing bat water baptism as an, as an expression of circumcision, is just simply not present in the New Testament. It's never talked about, it's never prescribed, it's never described. The only time baptism happens in Scripture is in response to someone's conversion or acceptance of Christ. The only time the Bible in the New Testament talks about circumcision in the New Testament is when it's described that God will circumcise our hearts. Speaking of giving our hearts to Him and transforming us in that sense. What seals us is what marks us beyond water baptism in the New Testament really is, is the presence of the Holy Spirit. And baptism reflects that. So in the New Testament, baptism is always in response to faith and repentance. And obviously an infant can't do that yet. So there's really no New Testament reason given for there to be infant baptism. That's why we reserve baptism for those who have already confessed and given faith in Christ. Secondly, what is the mode? How do we do that? Some sprinkle, some pour water out of a pitcher. Obviously, we, well, to use a modern vernacular, we dunk. <laughs> we get you wet. Why do we do that? The word, we get the word baptism from, it's, it's literally in Greek, it's baptizo. It's, it's, it's just an English way of saying the Greek word. It's a word that in the Greek language literally meant to immerse, to submerge. That's what the word means. If you were going to use the word submerge in ancient Greek, you would use the word baptizo. This is actually a fairly, it's, it's, this is an accepted definition of what that word means in the ancient Greek. And it is also fairly widely accepted that that was the practice of the early church in the first century or so. Immersion was always the normal practice of the early church unless there simply was a, 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 a problem with water being available. And we understand the ancient world, you know, we don't think too much about water being unavailable today, but the reality is if you're in the ancient world, running water was not exactly just around the corner and sometimes that could be an issue. But outside of that, the early church always immersed as they baptized. The handful of times in the New Testament, it talks about someone being baptized, it even describes it. It talks about them going into the water and coming up out of the water, whether it's the Ethiopian that Philip is part of the conversion, or whether it's even John himself baptizing. It's always describing an immersion in water. So to wrap all this up, Finally, baptism is not an expression of, it's, not a, it's, it's an expression of a conversion, of the accomplished salvation of the work of Christ. It proclaims the, what Christ has done through the death and burial and resurrection. It's, an, it's a picture of how, like we're in the water, we're also in Christ. It's not an expression of a rededication. It doesn't, it does, it's not something I do every once in a while to make myself feel better. It's something done once in response to faith and conversion and it proclaims the gospel as it takes place. Now, we could spend weeks on just that, but I also want to look at the second of these two ordinances this morning, and that is the Lord's Supper. If you will turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul is giving some instructions to the church there in Corinth about how they take part in and mark what we call today the Lord's Supper. I want to begin in verse 23. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, for, 
in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this, eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. A man must examine himself, and in so doing, he has to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself. If he does not, judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number asleep. But if we judge ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. Now, I'm just going to pause right there. There's a lot packed in there. Again, we could probably spend more time on that. But tonight, we just or this morning, we want to do a brief overview. The context of Jesus' of the Jesus' command to observe the supper obviously takes place on that light before his crucifixion. We call it the Last Supper. A Passover meal is what that was, a night that was dedicated in the Jewish, uh, in the Jewish context to remember the Passover, that moment when God rescued them out of slavery in Egypt centuries before. A meal meant to remember and celebrate God's work in delivering Israel out of that oppression. And Jesus takes two elements of that Passover meal, the bread and the, and the wine, and he uses them to represent his body and his blood given for us that we might have freedom as well from sin as Israel had freedom from slavery. As the bread is broken, it represents Jesus' body broken for us. As the cup is poured out, so is Jesus' blood poured out to cover our sins. It's a means by which we remember what he did again and again as baptism also reminds us of this as well. The Corinthians, to whom Paul's writing here, have distorted and abused the Lord's Supper. They were using it as a time to flaunt their wealth and to divide rich from poor. They were using it as a time to even get drunk and hoard food and to party. It looked more like a pagan ritual than it did the Lord's Supper. Look more like a festival that the Greeks would have celebrated to one of their gods as opposed to remembering what Christ has done. So Paul gives some instructions. It's simple. He says they should prepare for the meal by examining their own lives and hearts. For to take it in an unworthy manner is to court some very serious potential consequences. Paul implies there that some have even gotten sick and even died because they have been abusive of the celebration of the Lord's Supper. That's significant. So how do we avoid that? First, the supper, again, is for those who have, through grace and faith, accepted the work of Jesus and are, in fact, His. It is dangerous and deceptive to take the bread and the cup and, by so doing, identify yourself with Jesus when you, in fact, haven't actually done that. Secondly, as believers, if there is sin, if there is division, if there is pride, we need to deal with that. We need to confess it. We need to repent and make those things right. Paul said to examine ourselves. We're taking a meal to remember one who has died for our sins, to take that act of remembrance while embracing our unconfessed sin is arrogant and foolish. Thirdly, while it may not be directly studied in the New Testament, it never says in the New Testament that you have to be baptized before taking the Lord's Supper. We understand that the New Testament practice was always to be baptized pretty closely after you accepted Christ. In fact, the normal situation was you accept Christ by faith, you become baptized, and at that point you take the Lord's Supper. The Supper was designed as a way to remember the death and the suffering of Christ and on, on our behalf. Baptism was, a way, was designed as a way to publicly express one's commitment and identification with those things. It was to be done in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. The natural order again presented is to accept through faith and grace, be baptized, and then regularly begin taking the Lord's Supper with other believers, identifying yourself with Christ and with one another. If there were exceptions to that, they were not the norm. So, Again, if I have proclaimed faith in Christ, but I have not, or if I have refused to be obedient in baptism, if I come to the Lord's Supper unbaptized for those reasons, I may be taking some, I may be taking some risks. As a result, this morning we want to practice what we talk about. 
we try to do this on a regular basis, and that is actually partake of the Lord's Supper. So my, my encouragement to you before we do this is to do exactly what we talked about in these few moments, and that is this. First of all, we're going to take some time to prepare. And by that, I don't mean, um, make, you know, like maybe your mom used to make you wash your hands before supper. I, I don't mean that in a literal sense at the moment. But there is a sense that we are going to, in getting ready for the supper, for this meal, we are going to wash ourselves. We are going to sit down before the Lord and prepare our hearts. And I would say this. The supper is for all those who have come to faith in Christ. If you are a believer this morning, this is for you. If you're going to sit at the table one day in heaven, this table is for you as well. But let me encourage you before we do this to make sure that we take it in a manner that's worthy of Him. Now, that doesn't mean that you are perfect and holy and sinless. It means, are we right with the Lord this morning? Are we right with those around us this morning? Have we, in fact, already identified ourselves with the blood, the cross, and the life of Christ. So I want to just simply to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes and, and just examine your own heart this morning. Would you take a few moments of silent prayer to make sure that your heart is right with the Lord and that you are ready to take or come to the table and take the meal? Do that for a few moments, please. Father, as your people, we come to the table this morning. And Lord, for all of us who have expressed and given you our faith, have trusted you for our salvation, have repented, we thank you for what you have done for us. And Father, we this morning, we want the world to know, we want each other to know that we are with you. We are identified by our association with you. We belong to you. We are in you. Father, would you renew within us this morning a clean heart, a right spirit, so that as we are reminded today of what you have done for us, and even as we look forward to that day, we will be gathered around the table, the marriage feast of the Lamb. That we take this moment to remember as a memorial to say thank you and with a measure of joy that the salvation you have purchased for us and the joy that lies before us in eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you are, in fact, a believer and have been identified with Christ this morning, you are, in fact, invited to join with us as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Would, our, would, the, would the men who are coming up to help us serve this morning come forward right now? We're going to begin this morning by distributing the, the bread. I would simply ask as it's passed around, you take, you take the bread, you hold it, and we're going to all eat it together in a few moments. Greg, would you just pray a, a blessing over the bread?
night before his crucifixion, the Lord sat with his disciples that night, broke the bread and said this, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat. That night, Jesus also took the cup. He was prepared to distribute that. Bob, would you say a prayer of blessing? Again, that night before his crucifixion, Jesus took the cup. As he lifted it up, he prayed. He also said that this represented his blood, which was going to be shed and was shed for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink.
this morning we would not want to leave without giving someone perhaps the opportunity who has never identified themselves with Christ, who maybe one has never placed their faith and their trust in Christ. If that's you this morning, if you have never come to Christ, confess your sins and place your faith upon him and ask for him to, to rescue you from this life, to save you. You have seen this morning demonstrated and you have heard the truth of what he has done for us. And I would encourage you this morning to even now accept that. And if you have, in fact, done that, but you've never publicly identified yourself with Christ through baptism, I would encourage you this morning to even make the decision, make the decision to do that as well. And if you want to do those things right now, I'll go and give you that opportunity right now. Craig is going to lead us in a, in a song of worship in response to what we've heard. And I want to ask you to stand. And if God's called you to respond to him this morning, I encourage you to do it right now. And if you want to wait till afterwards, talk to Alan and I, or even Alan will be in the back if you want to talk to him even right now. Whatever God's laid on your heart, you respond even right now as we sing. Let's praise the name. I cast my mind into Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bowed and drenched in tears, and they laid him down. In Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, the Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the wonderful God we have who gave his body, who gave his blood for us. That is such a deep, deep love. I hope this morning you have, it's been meaningful to you to be reminded of what he has done for us. Just a couple quick things before we are done this morning. Again, be praying for the, the team going to Kansas City this week. Uh, I, and I would actually even cover your prayers for us. Uh, uh, ben and Cheyenne are moving to Louisville, Kentucky this week. Ben will be starting seminary, or I say starting seminary. You've actually been online for a year. Uh, ben will be continuing his studies in seminary full-time in Louisville. And so, uh, obviously, we are proud of what God is doing in his life, and we're getting them moved up so they can begin classes here in the next few weeks. So uh, keep Ben and Cheyenne in your prayers as they begin this new adventure, following the Lord and what he has called them to be part of. Kids, this week are heading to the water park, yep. so we pray for you, right? Yes. All right. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, the water park on, uh, maybe there'll be some baptisms on some Wednesday afternoon. I don't know. Uh, there'll be some, by definition of the word, yeah. Yeah, there'll, there'll, be, some immer there'll be some immersions, I'm sure, this week. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> but, uh, and I know, uh, Alan, what do you all have going on Wednesday night? Oh, all right. Is it Bocadillo's or Bocadillo's? Either, either way. <laughs> It's pretty, it's pretty good food and ice cream, though, isn't it? All right, so things going on this week. With, of course, uh, uh, while I will be out of town, we will, in fact, our Wednesday night Bible study, Greg will be teaching Bible study this week, so I encourage you. Uh, kids are doing things. Youth are doing things. Uh, we'll have adult Bible study here at 630 on Wednesday night to be a part of that. All right, we will be dismissed this morning with these verses out of Jude. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to make you stand in the presence of his glory blameless, 
with great joy to the only God, our Savior, to Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forever. Amen. Amen. And we are dismissed.